day. My brother and I were actually home when they were doing the pesticide spraying, which was kind of abnormal. My mom rushed us inside because she didn't want us to get sprayed with pesticides. Very logical. But all the neighbors' horses stayed outside, our dogs stayed outside, and they were sprayed with pesticides. And then on top of that, the horses kept eating the grass, which had been sprayed with pesticides. So we effectively had poisoned a bunch of animals and their food, which of course upset me as an animal lover. And I went running to my mom, this is horrible, we can't do this, and she was, oh my god, how did I never realize that we can't do this? So we switched our farm to being organic. Now, that's fantastic in the fact that we can actually start to make change, but it made me realize humans do weird things for our own gain. We directly fight nature. We decide those pests shouldn't be here, let's kill them. Let's see, there's water over here, but we'd really rather it be over there, let's move it. We really like having warm indoor climates, let's make everything inside. We know about gravity, Let's just build our buildings vertically anyway. <laughs> Made me realize engineers are doing some pretty kooky things to fight nature. And it made me want to go into engineering. So I went ahead and I got a doctorate in structural engineering. The structural engineers are doing a lot of the fighting of nature. And then I went ahead and got a postdoc in industrial ecology, which is basically the study of how our industrial systems are affecting ecology. My group now is integrating those two areas, trying to understand how engineers are designing their systems, what materials we use, and what does that mean in terms of their effects on the environment. We do many things in my group, but one of the things that we study is concrete. Concrete is the stuff that's all around us. I invite you to go outside and look at all the gray stuff that we're surrounded by. That's predominantly concrete, okay? So it's a material that we really love to consume worldwide. And, as any cranky engineer will tell you, cement and concrete are not the same thing. <laughs> cement is a hydraulic binder. It's a binder that actually interacts with water and acts as a paste that can hold together crushed rocks. That paste plus crushed rocks, that's actually concrete. And concrete is a material that we use so much of around the planet that it's actually our second most consumed material, second only to water. So it's a material that we are consuming in the billions and billions of tons in terms of magnitude worldwide. Now, what if I told you this material that we're using worldwide, billions and billions of tons a year, could actually be part of our environmental solution? This is kind of a unique issue because cement itself is part of the environmental problem. The way we produce our cement is through limestone decarbonation, which, as you might be able to hear from the term, we are actually pulling carbon out of limestone and just sending it into the atmosphere as CO2. And in order to get that reaction to take place, we're using energy. So not only is there a chemical reaction releasing CO2, but we're also using energy resources to release CO2. And I just told you we're using billions and billions of tons of concrete and billions of tons of cement to hold the concrete together. Cement is contributing 7 to 8% of our anthropogenic CO2 emissions globally right now. But that high level of consumption, that high level of emissions, means we have a really high potential for change. If all of those emissions are coming from one material, just a moderate tweak in how we're adjusting that material could actually have a significant world reduction in CO2 emissions. And then on top of it, if we're using billions of tons of this material every year, and we're using it for a long period of time, we like our roadways to stay in place, we like to keep using our buildings, we can actually use this as a CO2 sink. If we can engineer our concrete to absorb CO2 instead of emit it, we can actually bury carbon dioxide in the built environment and not be as dependent on geologic reserves in order to store CO2 in the future. Now, there are some tricks associated with this. First, we can't compromise material performance. We like to use the material for a long period of time. We'd rather it not crumble. We'd rather it not fall down. So we do need to make sure that if we come up with an alternative, we actually need to engineer it in a way that it still facilitates its use. In addition to that, the way we quantify environmental impacts is itself a little bit of a sticky field. It's very data intensive, and different people can approach the exact same problem and come up with two completely different environmental impacts if they analyze it in a slightly different way. So we also need to have robust metrics in order to start to understand the mitigation potential possible associated with these materials. And then on top of that, 
If we do come up with an alternative, it performs perfectly, regardless of how we quantify the impacts, we know it's better for the environment, we need to have enough of that material to actually offset billions and billions of tons of concrete. So it's what my PhD advisor would refer to as a wicked problem, right? There are many things that we should be taking into account concurrently. This kind of brings me back to how my mom started to approach organic farming. When she moved the farm off of conventional, she started to use nature-based solutions to come across ways to deal with the pests, ways to deal with fertilizer that we would be able to do in an organic fashion, using manure instead of chemical fertilizers, using oils from plants instead of chemical pesticides, and actually using what nature has already developed in order to facilitate our end goals. And that's something that we could start to do in the built environment as well. Basically, nature already had a working carbon cycle. It was cycling carbon through the environment, and we decided to fuss with it. <laughs> we fussed with it a little bit too hard, and now, if we can start to leverage how it is actually already occurring, we might be able to re-engineer our systems using methods that nature has already developed in a very robust fashion. We can start to leverage photosynthesis in order to actually get direct air capture into our biomass and then use that biomass in the built environment in order to hold on to that carbon for a long enough period of time such that it acts as a sequestration mechanism. And we can actually use methods not unlike how rocks were formed, through accelerated weathering to actually create materials not too dissimilar from concrete and start to accelerate how we're pulling CO2 out of the environment and sticking it into something that serves a function and holds on to it long enough that we can actually start to fight climate change. In fact, these small modifications could cumulatively start to lead to, in theory, a net sink of a material. That's going to take a little while. It's not going to be tomorrow. But tomorrow, even if we make small modifications, we could actually start to cut 50 to 60 percent of our CO2 emissions just by redesigning the materials that we're already using. So using all of these in concert, we could actually start to hit really strong mitigation goals very, very soon. Now, I realize you're sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this woman is babbling about concrete. I can't do anything with <laughs> You actually do have the power to make change as well. While you yourselves might be not the main purchaser of concrete, and also don't panic, it doesn't need to be your next patio or your next driveway that you have to make a radical change for, the vast majority of the concrete that we use worldwide is actually publicly owned. So if you imagine, for example, in the US, our highway systems, our sewer systems, those are all systems that the government actually owns. And the government was the one that had to buy it. So through public procurement, we can actually start to create markets for these novel materials and actually start to purchase and use them readily as long as we're electing officials that will endorse such types of purchasing. Um, so you can actually start to have a huge shift through voting. You can actually have a huge shift through which policymakers you start to place into your environment. So with that, I would like to thank you.